Okay, so in step eight, things get really exciting as you'll finally get your hands on using the machine learning model. In this step, you'll be adding more code to script.js. So this is a file you'll be editing again and adding further code to. Let's walk through the code to make sure you understand what it all does. As before, your model variable is first set to undefined to indicate that the model has not yet loaded. This globally accessible variable is where you'll store the loaded model once it's ready so that it's usable by other functions that call it. On the next line, you can now load the Cocoa SSD model by calling Cocoa SSD.load. Remember, you imported the Cocoa SSD model variable in your HTML page just before you imported the script.js code, which is where this variable comes from. Now, this load is asynchronous, so as before, you use the then keyword to wait for it to complete, upon which it will call a function of your choosing. Here, you'll use an inline anonymous function for simplicity that takes one parameter, which is simply the model class that's loaded once it's ready. Once the model has loaded, you can assign the loaded model to your global model variable so that it's no longer undefined. And then finally, you can remove the invisible class from the demo section to automatically ungray it once the model has loaded to visually show the user the demo is ready to be used. Moving on through the code, next you'll define an array named children. This array will be used to store all of the HTML elements that you will draw to the screen that will be used to highlight the objects found in a given frame of video. Pushing all of those objects to an array makes it easy to keep track of what you need to delete before rendering the next frame of data in an efficient manner. Next, you'll create a function called predict webcam. This function will act as the animation loop, if you will. What this means is that once it's performed a prediction once, it will call itself again to try and predict the next frame of video when ready, and so on and so forth until you close the window. This is known as a recursive function as it calls itself at the end, as you'll see later. Here you can see the first thing it calls is model.detect. This single line of code is where the magic happens for actually doing the machine learning model inference, which is the act of actually using the model to do some work. Now do take note that all the code prior to this step was pretty much regular web engineering, setting up the user interface, dealing with interaction, or loading things in. The actual act of using the machine learning model was just one line of code, as you just saw. Okay, so model.detect takes a single parameter, in this case, an image-like object. And what do I mean by image-like? Well, essentially, if you look at the documentation, the model is able to digest any one of the following HTML elements, including video, image, or canvas. So here, you can pass it the HTML video element that you had a reference to, from which it will sample a frame in that moment of time and try and detect what object it can find in that image frame. Now, this act of prediction is asynchronous, so it might take a few milliseconds to execute, which for a computer is a very long time. Therefore, you must again use the then keyword to wait for the predictions to come back. Once the predictions are ready, they'll be sent to the function specified. In this case, you'll use an inline anonymous function once again, which simply takes one parameter that will be the object containing the predictions that was returned by the model. Diving into the code for this anonymous function, the next task is to clear the page of any previous elements you used to draw found objects before you draw any new ones. Remember that children array you defined a few slides back? Well, it's time to loop through this array and remove any children contained within the live view element, which is the element you'll use to render bounding boxes for objects found. Finally, you can use a neat trick by calling splice zero on the children array to delete all the array's contents efficiently in one line of code. With this done, you're now ready to draw the bounding boxes for the new objects that have been found. But what exactly are bounding boxes and how are they defined? Essentially, in this use case, they're just rectangles that are drawn around an object of interest in an image. In order to draw a rectangle, you need four pieces of information. The top left XY coordinate where the rectangle will start, along with the width and the height of the box itself. With that, you'd then be able to draw any rectangle to the screen. Let's go ahead and see what comes back from your model predictions. You can now loop through the array of predictions that are returned by the model predict function call in a regular for loop as shown. 
Remember, there might be more than one prediction, as there could be, say, several cats in the image at the same time, for example, which is why you need to use a loop here. So while n is less than the prediction's length, you're going to inspect each nth prediction further. Now, for every prediction found, you can check the score of the prediction. In machine learning, when you classify something, many models produce a number that's often linked to how confident the model was that the object was indeed the thing it thinks it is. Reading the Coco SSD documentation, you learn the score represents a percentage confidence, but the numbers will range from 0 to 1. So a value of 0.66 would mean it was 66% sure, you just need to multiply by 100 to get the percentage value in this case. On this line, you can set a minimum threshold of confidence to only draw bounding boxes for items that the model is really sure about to reduce the chance of it drawing something incorrectly, also known as a false positive. As a developer, it's up to you to decide what's an acceptable score to use in order to draw items that your end users will then see. Do you want more or less false positives? If you set the value too high, you may never see anything, and it should be noted that different models will need different thresholds to work well. Experiment with this value to see how it changes what's drawn once you've completed the code lab. Continuing to the next line of code, if the prediction exceeds your minimum threshold specified, you can render some details about what was found to the web page. Here, you can create a new paragraph element in memory using document.createElementP so that you can then render some text to the page. On this next line, you can set the paragraph's inner text to be the predictions class that represents the name of the object, like cat, dog, chair, and so on. You can also print out the prediction score, too. Now remember that the score will be a floating point number with a value between 0 and 1. So here, you can use the pass float to ensure the number is interpreted as floating point, and then multiply it by 100 to get the score as a percentage, and finally, you can use math.round to convert it to an integer to make it look a little neater to look at on the eyes. Next, you can add some CSS styles in line on the creative paragraph element so that it's positioned in the same location as where the object was found. Notice here that the current prediction object has a property named bbox. Inspecting this on the console, you can discover that it's actually an array with four elements. As you may have guessed, those four values correspond to the top left x and y coordinates for the bounding box rectangle, along with the width and height. So bbox0 would be the top left x coordinate, bbox1 would be the top left y coordinate, bbox2 would be the width, and bbox3 would be the height. You can use these values to position the paragraph text in a sensible location, like the top left of the bounding box, as shown using the regular CSS styling. Now, the keen-eyed among you may have noticed I subtracted 10 pixels from the Y position and also from the width. This is because in the CSS styles you copied earlier, I have a 5 pixel padding on these elements, so to compensate for that, you must subtract 10 pixels in each dimension so it renders in the correct position on the screen. The only thing left to do now is to draw the bounding box and add all the elements to the page. Here you'll use a div element by creating document.createElementDiv set with a class of highlighter so that it gets a nice semi-transparent background and a bright border from the style.css code copied earlier. Then just like before, you can set the CSS style properties manually for the left, top, width, and height of the element using the values in the bbox array to position it so it overlays the correct part of the webcam video stream to highlight the object found. Now that all the modifications of the new elements are complete, you can append the newly created div and paragraph to the live view container to put it onto the web page itself. Now, by using a pen child, you're actually adding it to the HTML page, making it visible. And the reason you do this now rather than before is for efficiency. If you had added the elements first and then started changing their styles and values, every time you made a change, the page would need to re-render and reflow all the other visible elements too. By keeping them in memory until everything is pre-calculated and finalized, you can create a highly efficient web page as the reflow will only occur once. Next, you can add both of the newly created elements to the children array, which will be used as a quick reference to delete them of the next run through the function, so that they're disposed of correctly before rendering the new results. Note that the order in which you add the elements matters here, as you want the paragraph to be rendered on top of the bounding box. For this reason, it must be added after as the last element added will have a higher z-index 
than the one before by default. The only thing left to do now is to recursively call this function again once the browser is ready. You can use window.requestAnimationFrame to do this, which will pass control back to the browser to finish up anything it needs to do, and when the browser is ready, it will call the function pass to it, which in this case is the same function you're currently writing, predict webcam. This will then start the loop all over again, except next time, the new video information will be available, allowing you to update the position of the bounding boxes. You should always use request animation frame to avoid jankiness and never use set timeout for render loops like this to ensure the best performance across devices. So with that, it's time to copy the code you just learnt over into the project for the grand finale. Feel free to pause the video whilst you do that and then continue when you're ready. All right, so if you copied everything over correctly, you should now see a live preview like the one shown here after you click the enable webcam button on the app. Bounding boxes will be drawn around anything it recognizes, so try different objects like bottles, chairs, beds, and see what it can detect, or check the documentation for more details. The other thing to note at this point is that the core code related to the Coco SSD model itself was only three or so lines of code. The rest was either setting up the user interface just like you would do for any other web app, or writing code for the post-processing of the results in order to draw the outputs to the screen, like rendering the bounding boxes. And TensorFlow.js pre-made models like this are very easy to use. And remember, the others detailed before can be used in exactly the same frictionless manner, just with different inputs and outputs. So congratulations, you've just created your very first machine learning powered web application with TensorFlow.js. Now, step nine recaps what you've learned, so let's take a look at that. In this exercise, you've learned the benefits of using TensorFlow.js pre-made models and created a fully working web app that utilizes one of them to classify common objects in real time using your webcam. This involved you creating a HTML skeleton for the content, defining styles for the HTML elements, detecting and enabling a webcam stream, loading a pre-trained TensorFlow.js model, and then using that model to make continuous classifications on the video data from the webcam, and finally drawing bounding boxes around the found objects in the image. As for the next steps, I highly recommend you play and experiment with the code you've just written before continuing. For example, try changing the confidence threshold for detection and see what renders when you make it really low, say 0.1, or really high, like 0.95. What do you notice? Also, think about how you can take what you've just made and extend it to solve a real world problem of your own, like I did with the pet cam example. Maybe even try to recreate something similar if you want. Now, if you decide to try that, consider the following questions. What extra code can you write to detect if two objects intersect? For example, when a person sits on a couch. This extra code and logic needed is just regular JavaScript at this point, all of the machine learning is already done. You then may want to think about how you might alert yourself to the fact this has happened. Maybe you can use WebSockets or a third party API to send yourself an email or a text message. It's completely up to you. And finally, if you send an alert every time an event happens, you might want to consider the edge cases where multiple objects come into and out of the view. How can you deal with a group of people at a party sitting on a couch? Maybe you want to have some time delay before you send a notification, or maybe you want to send a notification only if the number of people increases rather than decreases. There are many edge cases to consider, but all of these things are regular web engineering problems and are not machine learning problems. So feel free to experiment with this and see what you can make. Now, if you'd like to see how I solved some of these problems in my pet cam solution that builds upon the code you wrote today, feel free to check out this video that goes into much more detail and check out the code directly via the link shown. Now, if you make something useful, consider sharing it with the community using the made with TFGS hashtag on social media like Twitter and LinkedIn so we can see what you've created. Mm -hmm.